I'm uh, Dr. Lloyd Damon, Professor of Medicine at UC San Francisco. I'm the Director of Hematology and Blood and Marrow Transplantation. Uh, our donor today is a 30-year-old man, and he's donating uh, his bone marrow to his father. His father is 60 years old, and he is a patient with acute myeloid leukemia with high-risk features and first remission. Uh, his high-risk feature is he has a mutation of the FLT3 gene, and this predicts a very low curability with chemotherapy only. In order to maximize cure and long-term survival, uh, he needs an allergenic transplant either hematopoietic stem cells from the blood or bone marrow collected from the back pelvis of his donor. And his when we are looking for an allogeneic donor for hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, our preference, number one, is a fully HLA-matched sibling. Our second preference is a fully HLA-matched unrelated adult donor. Our third preference is umbilical cord blood and our fourth pres preference is haploidentical uh, donor. If we need to go to the fourth uh, level and do a haplo transplant, then our preference is to use a child as opposed to a sibling as opposed to an adult as the donor. Uh, in his case, we could not find a fully matched adult donor and therefore we have identified his son as a haplo type, that is half of his HLA antigens are matched and we're going to do an allogeneic haploidentical transplant from his son, the donor. Uh, because it's a haploidentical transplant, uh, the preferred source of hematopoietic stem cells is the bone marrow rather than the bloodstream. The reason for this is in bone marrow, there's tenfold less T cells compared to blood, and that reduces the risk of graft-versus-host disease, a complication of transplant down the line. Um, we have brought our donor uh, into the operating room and through general anesthesia is now asleep and in the prone position on his stomach. Uh, we've, uh, through typical surgical technique, cleaned the back pelvis and have used sterile drapes to isolate the back pelvis where we'll be harvesting marrow. And I'd like to emphasize that our uh, donor is not considered a patient but an organ donor and therefore a person. That person came to us well. So we have to maximize safety in the effort of taking the uh, proposed organ that he is donating, in this case, bone marrow. So safety is foremost, and uh, achieving our goals of a good collection is secondary. Okay, are we all ready for incision? Yes. Yes. Sure, in the operating room, once everything is prepared and our patient is ready, uh, we then enter the bone marrow cavity through the bone cortex using bone marrow needles. Once we are there, we then aspirate five cc's or one teaspoon of bone marrow, turn the needle 90 degrees, re-aspirate another five cc's and do that for a total of four times, therefore in four quadrants, so that we end up with about 20 cc's per uh, aspiration procedure. We then take that collected bone marrow and put it into our collection bag. We then repeat the procedure upwards of 75 times on each side of the pelvis in order to get the volume that we need to successfully do a transplant. If we aspirate more than five cc's uh, at a setting, then we begin to pull blood through the bone marrow sinusoids rather than bone marrow. Um, what we really need are the hematopoietic stem cells and therefore we want to minimize diluting the product with blood. Uh, the question that we face in the operating room is how much bone marrow to uh, remove in order to successfully do the transplant. The minimum generally established is 10 milliliters per kilogram, and for safety reasons, the maximum to take from the donor is 20 mil per kilogram. Because this is a haploidentical transplant and there's a higher than usual chance of rejecting the graft, we're going for the maximum, in this case 20 mil per kilogram, based on the donor size, roughly 1.7 liters of bone marrow. Uh, so at the end of the procedure, the donor is going to have an achy backside. Uh, we do put a long-acting local anesthetic in the periosteum of the pelvis called Marcane to keep him as comfortable as possible for several hours post-procedure. Uh, but he will be up and about and uh, moving for the next several days with some soreness in the backside and sometimes in the back thighs. He will be a bit fatigued because we've done the equivalent of two and a half to three units of blood removal.
Um, in order to facilitate his recovery, he has donated autologous blood to himself and will give a unit of autologous blood back to him in the recovery room after the procedure. So several points to make in summary. Uh, a bone marrow harvest is considered a low risk procedure, uh, but associated with pain and therefore our donors are uh, uh, prepared under general anesthesia. They are asked to give at least one unit of autologous blood uh, before the procedure so that we can give it back afterwards due to the high blood volume removed during the bone marrow harvest. Recovery is quick. Uh, donors rather do have several days of achiness in their backside, but with rapid improvement in my experience, uh, the chance of postoperative complications is incredibly low, and this is important to us because donors are people, not patients. Uh, once the uh, bone marrow product leaves the operating room, it's taken to our bone marrow transplant processing laboratory. In the laboratory, it's registered. It's double-checked that the label is correctly attached, that we are aware who the donor is and who the recipient will be. A blood type is done on the bone marrow specimen to confirm it does come from the appropriate donor. Um, a sample is then uh, taken from the uh, bone marrow product to, to check the total nucleated cell count so that we have that established uh, as a specific dose that will be given to the recipient uh, later on. A sample of the bone marrow is also taken for culture to look for any contaminating bacteria uh, that might be present. That culture will take six days to return before we have the answer regarding that. Um, and the product is weighed so that we know the exact volume uh, of bone marrow that has been collected. Within the collection bag is bone marrow and media. The media that we use is called Normosol, which contains appropriate electrolytes and glucose to maintain uh, metabolism of the cells while they're outside of the human environment. In terms of the transplant itself, uh, the bone marrow product is run intravenously into the recipient and the bone marrow hematopoietic stem cells know to go to the bone marrow cavity, stop there, and will reproduce a new bone marrow and therefore blood for the recipient. So uh, our patient, the recipient, uh, first had induction chemotherapy for his acute malignant leukemia that put him in complete remission. But keeping in mind that he has a high risk mutation in the FLT3 gene, his chance of cure is low and his chance of relapse is very high with additional chemotherapy and that's why we've chosen an allogeneic transplant as his best leukemia therapy in the long run. Once we have collected the product, it will be infused intravenously into the recipient. Uh, those hematopoietic stem cells have homing receptors that will link them into the bone marrow niche where they belong and uh, the conception that we have to inject directly back into the bone marrow space is not true. Uh, the patient, the recipient, who is the donor's father, has done very well. He spent about four weeks in the hospital. His neutrophils engrafted quite promptly around day 18 of transplantation, uh, which is right on uh, with a haploidentical transplant. At the time of his hospital discharge, he had not fully engrafted platelets, but we do expect that to occur in the next one to two weeks. As an outpatient, we can continue to support the recipient with platelet transfusions until engraftment takes place. And our patient was discharged. There were no signs of graft versus host disease. We'll continue immunosuppressive uh, therapy going forward to minimize that probability and monitor him carefully in clinic for the possibility of chronic graft versus host disease many months later. The important uh, points to be made uh, after reviewing this video of a bone marrow harvest is that we're doing bone marrow in this case rather than peripheral blood because it's a haploidentical transplant and I want to minimize the possibility of graft versus host disease in the recipient later on. Uh, we do want to emphasize that there's a minimum amount of bone marrow to collect and a maximum. In this case we're achieving the maximum uh, because it is haploidentical and we need to overcome the rejection barrier. Other details uh, regarding the specifics of the procedure are not important. Right. So when we're going to perform an allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplant, we need to get our stem cells and our two choices are either out of the blood of the donor or out of the pelvic bone marrow. A bloodstream donation is more simple than a bone marrow harvest. 
In order to do the peripheral blood stem cell collection, we need to mobilize hematopoietic stem cells out of the bone marrow and into the bloodstream because in the normal physiologic state, they don't circulate much. We do this through a hematopoietic growth factor called granocyte colony stimulating factor. Uh, this is given four days in a row, and on the fifth day, uh, we attach our donor to the apheresis machine and begin the collection now with hematopoietic stem cells circulating in the blood. The donor is attached to an apheresis machine, which is simply a large centrifuge. The centrifuge, by spinning, divides the blood into parts, plasma on top, the buffy coat layer in the middle, and the red cell layer underneath. We then siphon off the buffy coat, which contains white cells, and therefore the hematopoietic stem cells that we need for transplantation. Uh, this siphon buffy coat is put into a collection bag uh, with anticoagulant. So the blood circulates from our donor into the machine uh, where the separation of blood into parts takes place and the collection of the buffy coat is accomplished. Uh, the remaining parts of the blood, the plasma layer and the red cells are continuously returned back to the donor and actually the blood loss at the end of the procedure is no more than 250 cc's or half of a blood donation at the blood bank. The product, once it's collected, is taken to our bone marrow transplant processing laboratory uh, where it is sampled to get a cell count, to get a culture for bacteria, and to get a blood type sample to be sure it's from the appropriate donor as um, indicated. And then they undergo cryopreservation. That is to say, they are frozen in liquid nitrogen. Those cells are in a state of suspended animation and are actually viable and usable for decades after they are collected and cryopreserved. We bring the cryopreserved stem cells to the bedside, thaw them out in a water bath, and infuse them intravenously. Those hematopoietic stem cells go to the microenvironment of the bone marrow, will be anchored there, will recapitulate the marrow, and rebuild blood production.